Can you solve this question about gravitation in A-level physics? Part A, define the gravitational potential energy. Well, remember the gravitational potential energy is defined as the work done in bringing a mass from infinity to a point. Remember that if you're asked to define the gravitational potential, then this is the work done in bringing a unit mass. Next one, we're given some data, and what we need to do is to show that the magnitude of the gravitational potential energy is about 7 times 10 to the power of 11 joules. Um, okay, well, GPE is given by minus GMM divided by R. So we have all the data available. So we're going to write minus 6.67 times 10 to the power of minus 11 multiplied by the mass. So um, mass of the sun is 2.0 times 10 to the power of 30. Then I'm going to multiply that by the mass of the space probe, which is 810 kilograms. Let's divide that by the orbital distance. And we're given the orbital radius, which is one astronomical unit around 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11. Let's put this into a calculator. And what we're going to get is minus 7.2 times 10 to the power of 11. Um, here we're just given the magnitude, so we don't really have to worry about the negative sign. Okay, next one, show that the kinetic energy of the space probe is half the value. Okay, well, a couple of different ways of approaching that. Kinetic energy, sticking to the fundamentals, is just a half mv squared. Now, how do we find the speed v if we're given the orbital radius, which we are, and we're also given the orbital period, we can just use 2 pi times the orbital radius, divide that by the orbital period t. Um, okay, so I'm going to say that this is equal to a half m, and rather than v squared, I'm going to write 2 pi r divided by t squared. So this will give me a half times the mass, which is 810, and then I'm going to multiply this by 2 pi times the orbital radius, which is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11. Let's divide that by the um, orbital period, which is conveniently given to us in seconds. So this here will be 3.16 times 10 to the power of 7. So remember, anytime we're squaring something, we have to be super careful not to forget the square like so. Okay, we're ready to put this into a calculator. And this here will give me around 3.6 times 10 to the power of 11 joules, which is half of the value from above. So we know that it's got to be right. Okay, calculate the total energy of the space probe. Now, notice that the two, this question here has a trick actually. So for the total energy, because they have a different sign, we need to take them away. So this here will be minus 7.2 uh, times 10 to the power of 11 plus 3.6 times 10 to the power of 11, giving us a total energy of minus 3.6 times 10 to the power of 11 joules. Um, note that this is because uh, the object is in orbit. If we keep increasing its kinetic energy and that eventually reaches up to zero, we'll have reached the escape velocity um, of this object. Okay, cool. So the next one, the power source for the instrumentation on the board of the space probe is plutonium-238, which provides 470 watts initially. So plutonium decays by alpha particle emission with a half-life of 88 years. Now the first thing I'm going to do when I come across this uh, in a question, as soon as I see the half-life, I'm just going to write that the decay constant is equal to ln of 2 divided by t half because we know know that uh, if we have the half-life, we have the decay constant. So this here will be ln of 2 divided by um, 88 
uh, years. So this will be times 365 times 24 times 3600, whatever that is. We'll calculate that in a minute. Um, okay, the kinetic energy of each alpha particle is something. Calculate the number of plutonium nuclei needed to provide the power of 470 watts. Well, here's the idea of the question. If the power source provides 470 watts and each, uh, the kinetic energy of each alpha particle is this much, 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 13, then we can work out the actual activity of the source. Um, how can we do that? Because power is just energy divided by time, um, and the activity is actually the number of particles per second if each particle has this many um, joules, then if we were to divide those two numbers, we're actually going to get the activity. So I'm just going to say that 470 divided by 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 30. And this here will just give me around 5.3 times 10 to the power of 14. So once again, if this is the total power and uh, the energy of each particle is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 13, then if I were to divide those, I'm going to get the number of particles per second, which is my activity. We're nearly there. We have our activity, but remember, activity is also linked to the decay constant via A is equal to lambda times N, and N is what we're ultimately looking for, the number of particles. So as we mentioned the question, anytime we see the half-life, we can calculate the decay constant. If we actually put this into a calculator, we're going to get around 2.5 times 10 raised to the power of minus 10 s to a power of minus 1. Okay, well, we can put that directly into there and rearrange for n, and our final equation for the number of particles will be 5.3 times 10 to the power of 14 becquerels, which is our activity, divide that by the decay constant, which is 2.5 times 10 to the power of minus 10. And this here will give me 2.1 times 10 to the power of 24 particles. Quick little check, this here is a large number as you would expect for the number of particles. Okay, next one, part two, or part II, calculate the power still available 100 years later. Well, if we're dealing with something 100 years later, the activity will be changing exponentially. And I'm going to do this a little bit differently compared to the Mark scheme, uh, but I think that might be um, a different, more uh, easier to guess way. So, if the original activity is 5.3 times 10 to the power of 14, well, that activity will drop exponentially with a is equal to a naught e to the minus lambda t. Well, the activity is the number of particles per unit time. So we can just say particles per second. What we need to find out to get the power is the total energy per time or the energy, the number of joules per second. Um, so the way we're going to do that is we're going to get the activity and multiply by the energy of one of those particles. So I'm going to do a naught e to the minus lambda t multiplied by the energy of one particle. I'm going to say that this is just equal to e. Uh, okay, well, let's plug in some numbers into this equation. Our original activity was 5. Uh, 3 times 10 to the power of 14. Let's multiply that by E times the decay constant, um, which is minus LN of 2. Divide that by 88. Because this is in 100 years, I'm going to keep the 88 in years. 
uh, times a hundred and then I need to multiply that by the energy of an individual particle which was here 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power minus 13 so times 8.8 .8 times 10 to the power of minus 13. Okay, well, this here is going to give me around 212 watts, which up to two significant figures is 210 watts. Please note that the mark scheme suggests using the fact that the power is going to be um, proportional to the exponential as well, because the power is also uh, directly proportional to the activity, uh, as we can see this what's actually causing it in this equation and this is a totally valid equivalent way but I think that this um, relationship is kind of hard to guess but let me know what you think in the comment comments below which method do you prefer okay guys well hopefully this video has been very very useful you also find this video right over here very very useful with some crucial revision on gravitation so click right over here